Okay, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, everyone is uh, doing well. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, rumor has it that uh, there might be a very important uh, baseball game that some folks uh, might want to watch starting at 8. Um, so we'll uh, go ahead and start now and uh, get through at least the core of the program uh, in time for folks to who want to catch the baseball game um, to do so. So my name is Dr. Stephen Payne. I'm the director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Um, there's uh, quite a few people signed up for tonight's program. Um, some names I recognize, but but quite a few that I don't recognize. So welcome to those of you who um, have never attended a Bronx Historical Society event before, or if you have, um, it hasn't been very recently. Um, so great to see so many uh, new people signed up to our events. And tonight's program um, will be a very interesting program on Hart Island. Um, we have a, a historian of Hart Island um, who made a, a documentary that we'll be screening first. Uh, and then the author and historian will uh, um, be sharing his insights on his work. And there'll be some time for Q&A as well. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our guest here, um, the historian of Hart Island who made the documentary and who will be speaking tonight. Michael Keane is the author of eight nonfiction books, uh, nine local history videos, and an award-winning 40-episode podcast, um, which he'll be saying more about uh, it's on Hart Island. Although employed for 25 years as a financial advisor, Michael has combined his interest in writing, historical research, and filmmaking to explore unique and fascinating episodes of 19th century history and stranger than life legends. The events that bubbled out of this period include the orphan train phenomenon, the origins of the modern spiritualist movement, the women's right and abolitionist movements, as well as the founding of seven new religions and utopian communes, um, some even in upstate New York. Michael's work also explores the history of the treatment of insanity the building of the Erie Canal and the hidden history of America's largest mass graveyard, Hart Island. What began as a hobby 15 years ago has now become a glorious obsession. Um, so we'll have plenty of opportunity to speak with uh, Mike himself after the video, but let's go ahead and, and get, get the video started. And if uh, folks have any difficulty um, um, with uh, sound or the video just let me know but hopefully all things will go smoothly although you never know um, with technology technology is a fickle uh, fickle mistress um so i'm going to go ahead and start the video and then after it's over um my okay everyone i hope um i hope uh folks uh were able to to catch at least the vast majority of it looks like we've got some more people who've logged in in between when we started and now. So what we'll do now is um, Mike, uh, the creator of this wonderful documentary and a historian of Hard Island, among many other things, will um, uh, talk a little bit with us about uh, uh, how he got interested in this topic, um, among other things. And then we'll have uh, about 20 minutes afterwards for um, a Q and A from the audience. But uh, feel free to go ahead and add your questions to the Q&A now. Um, so then once we get to the Q&A uh, section, there'll be uh, plenty of questions to draw on. And also, um, folks can raise their hands during that section as well. Um, so before we get to Q&A, though, Mike, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to show this video tonight and for making yourself available and uh, sharing your insights about this um, incredibly rich and important uh, aspect of New York City and Bronx history. Um, why don't you just, uh, you know, say a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us, uh, you know, how you first got interested in this topic. Uh, well, thank you, Steve. And as I told you earlier, I know there's a baseball game coming up, so I'm going to talk fast. Go Yankees, by the way. Um, a lot of times my best ideas, frankly, are given to me by people. Uh, or who will point something out to me that requires me to look into it. I, I find that there's an interest there. And so I received an email from a gal who has designed my book covers. 
And she said, I think you might be interested in this story. And the story was the initial uncovering, if you will, of Heart Island, some of the bodies that became exposed as a result of Hurricane Sandy, the reason that the video begins with, with the, uh, the storm. And, and so I learned that there was a million people buried there, but I didn't know what I was going to do about that. Um, on one hand, that's pretty interesting stuff, but I'm always looking for a hook or an angle, if you will. And so on a completely unrelated topic, I'm doing some um, casual research on the Second World War. And I come across Joseph Stalin, the former dictator, president, what have you, premier of Russia and the uh, Soviet Union, who came out with a rather interesting statement. And he said, the death of one person is a tragedy. The death of a million people is just a statistic. And I thought about that. And I said, well, that is what I need to learn about Hard Island. I need to learn about some of the people that are buried there. I mean, by definition, you end up at Hard Island when nobody is able or wishes to claim your body. And on one level, how sad can that be? Uh, that you live your life and at the very end of it, there's no one there to take responsibility for your remains. And so I began to look more closely into that. And it's how I uncovered some of the people that you heard in the video. Um, so armed with this information, I wrote a book about Heart Island. Um, but then subsequently, actually when COVID hit, uh, when no one was allowed to, to visit in person to give presentations, I used to give many of them across New York State, I decided to produce create this video. And when I was done, I, I thought I had only scratched the surface and decided to create a podcast, uh, which is comprised of 40 half hour episodes that really flesh out the story of Hard Island and actually add to this video because there are many more individuals that I was able to find information on. And so if you go to my website, this is totally free. You go to michaeltkeen.com and you go to the pull down tab and you'll see podcast. Click on the podcast and you'll see what I call the show notes of all 40 episodes. And they'll give you a one to two paragraph description of each one of the paragraphs. And essentially what the podcast is comprised of is my interviewing uh, a rather uh, a select group of individual uh, university professors, writers, uh, scientists, musicians, actors, who had some connection to Hard Island one way or another, and that who also had written about some of the individuals, including uh, some of the ones that you saw on the video uh, regarding Dawn Powell, Sheila Terry, Bobby Driscoll, and others. And so at the end of the podcast, at the end of the book, we hope you would like the book, you might want to pick up a copy, which you can on the website, um, that you'll learn more about not only the island and the history of New York City, which I think we cover in spades, actually, uh, but also uh, the remarkable stories of some of these people, who although were rather well known during their lifetime because of the ravages of uh, drug addiction and alcoholism and mental illness died without anyone to care for them. Um, some of the stories are sad, of course. Some are rather inspirational, how some people are able to persevere. I've always written about that. I've always been impressed by someone, not who's had an easy life, who's had a very difficult life, but is able to rise above their circumstances and, and become significant in their own way. So again, it, it, michaeltteen.com, you come to the podcast, it's free. You can download my media player. 
It'll give you more information on the video. You can see the video again because I have it listed on my podcast, plus information on the book, some of the reviews that I received on the book, uh, and a little bit more information about me. So knowing that the game is going to begin, I'll cut her off there. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to take a stab at it. Great. And I'm just going to type in um, to a chat to everyone um, the address to your website uh, so people can click on the link. Um, so we, we definitely have some Q&A already, as well as um, at least a couple people with their hands up. So we'll take uh, we'll go through some of the Q&A first and then we'll go to folks with their hands up. There's a lot of questions. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get through as many um, of folks' questions as possible. Um, but apologies if we're not able to get to everyone's. So the first, let me see here. Um, it says, my grandfather, this is from Wanda. Um, and Wanda says, my grandfather, maybe great-grandfather was buried um, on January 2nd, 1931. The video stated that the graves were reused every 25 years. Does this thing mean that my great grandfather's remains have been removed and he is no longer there? Uh, that very well could be. Not that his remains were removed, but that his remains now uh, cannot be removed because they have uh, decomposed. And think about uh, this. It's one thing to be buried in an anonymous grave with sometimes as many as 170 other people. That's one indignity. But then to think about that, the area that you were buried in can be reused 25 years later by another 171 people, which is the exact number. Uh, the bodies were not embalmed. Uh, the point was that they would eventually decompose so they could reuse the, the burial space that they had originally been interred in. That's why when you think about a million people on a fairly small area, you figure how can that possibly be? But because of the way that they did it, that's how they were able to do it. Okay, great. Mike, I'm just going to work down a few more of these before we take a couple of the people's with hands up and I go back and forth. This looks more like a comment, uh, in, uh, interesting comment from um, Francie. Ironically, that this is screened on the Feast of St. Jude, patron saint of hopeless cases. Is an interesting we can sure. thank Dr. Steve for that. <laughs> Completely <laughs> accidental, um, but uh, but as things like this often happen, um, uh, fortuitous. Um, okay, let's see. What island would infectious disease patients um, have uh, been sent to in the early 1930s? Uh, it's a good question. Actually, New York City's barrier islands in and of themselves uh, Brothers Island, I believe there's two Brothers Island, north and south. Um, uh, Roosevelt Island, which was originally called Blackwell's Island, uh, and others. These barrier islands were the original uh, places where people who had infectious diseases were put. That was to prevent them from coming to Manhattan. So there were a number of them. Um, a lot of them never made it, I mean, if they were already living in New York and, and the whole point about the Bowery, um, also AIDS, uh, people who had concoct, had come up with these diseases uh, were maybe later sent to places like, well, St. Vincent's Hospital. In, in, in the podcast, there is an episode about St. Vincent's Hospital Here's a story that should curl your, your toes. I talked to a fellow who had written a book and it was called The Ghost of St. Vincent's. And he had had AIDS. And at one point in his treatment, while a patient at St. Vincent was unable to swallow food and so was slowly wasting away. And one day his attending physician came to him and said, listen, I'm going on vacation. 
uh, for a couple of weeks, but I have somebody who will be covering for me. He leaves, the new doctor comes on board, woman who asks him what his problem was other than the fact that he's dying of AIDS. And he mentioned the thing about not being able to swallow. And she says, well, it sounds like you have something that I think we can treat, gives him a new medication. He begins to be able to eat, begins to gain weight. And at that time, they, they come up with what they believe is the AIDS cocktail that will enable uh, AIDS sufferers to actually live. He begins the AIDS cocktail. He recovers totally. And now, uh, and this happened 20 years ago, and now lives in California. Uh, I think living large in San Diego somewhere. All because his doctor went on vacation in some sort of strange way. So that, that's a wonderful interview with him as we explored what happened in New York City regarding AIDS. Also the use of uh, Heart Island. When they first buried the first AIDS victim in Heart Island, they buried them 14 feet deep because they were afraid that the AIDS virus, and, and I guess we can only surmise this because we don't have the people who did this to, to ask them, were they afraid that this virus would somehow seep out of the ground? So th there's a number of uh, stories like that, but that particular interview with about the ghost of St. Vincent's, I would highly recommend. Thank you, Mike. Um, there's a, uh, this is a comment by Melinda Hunt, who I think is from the Heart Island Project, if right. I'm not mistaken. Um, says the opening scene is based on a photo shoot that I organized. The erosion of bones was not discovered in 2014, but in 1992, because that's when she went on a boat um, with Greg Gobranson, because the DOC was questioning her her testimony about erosion at City Hall. Um, just pointing that out and looks like there might be um, some other uh, 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 other little pieces of information that Melinda might want to um, communicate. So Melinda, I'd encourage you to get in touch with um, Mike. Uh, I'll be sending out Mike's um, email address uh, as a follow-up um, uh, and it's on his website, I believe too. Uh, um, so folks who want to be in touch with uh, Mike can can do so. Just wanted to um, address that. I don't know if you want to say anything to that, Mike. Well, the only thing about um, the superstorm Sandy, which made it more evident and what it ever had happened 16 or 18 years earlier, I'm not too sure about, but Hart Island came to the attention of, of, of greater uh, New York as a result of the discovery of some of the erosion on Hart Island. And I was able to interview uh, Dr. Uh, David Robinson. He's a professor at Rutgers University, who is uh, the, the New York Jersey, New Jersey uh, climatologist, uh, which is a fascinating discussion with him about the role and how hurricanes uh, form and the role of Superstorm Sandy which is how we begin the video and and the erosion and what it did to New York City, which to me led me to understand the beginnings of the story of Hard Island. But I'm familiar with Melinda Hunt. She's done a lot of great work uh, in the area of Hard Island and her, I think, virtual um, cemetery, which has led to the discovery for many people of some of their um, their relatives. Okay, great. Let me, um, let's see, there's a few people with their hands up and then we'll keep working down the Q&A as well. So first of all, um, Mary Gill, if, uh, and when you put your hands up, um, that means you want to ask the question live instead of put in a Q&A. So um, we'll first allow Mary Gill to talk. Okay, let me see. All right, Mary, let me, okay, can try talking now, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes. I can, okay, yes. I understand with AIDS, you know, there was the fear, hence they they buried them deep. Um, you mentioned there was a fear with COVID. 
I actually worked in the morgue during COVID and I didn't see the same as it was back with AIDS. Why so many people ended up on Hart Island. Why did they end up on Hart Island? I, by yeah. the way, I don't know if they had the same fear <laughs> of the quote unquote, uh, the virus escaping as they did with AIDS. I had only run across the fact that they and buried the AIDS patients so deep as a result of that. Um, New York City, and I guess we'd have to, we don't have to go back that long ago, they were having an understanding of how many people died from uh, COVID uh, mm -hmm. in a very short period of time. And in fact, they had um, uh, refrigerated trucks uh, outside uh, because they had no other place to accommodate the bodies. Um, so anyone who would have ended up on Hart Island wouldn't have ended up there because they happened to have died of COVID-19. They would have ended up there if there was nobody to claim their body. Uh, the fact that they died of COVID-19 was of course why they died, but why they ended up on Hart Island is the reason, is because there was nobody to claim their body. Okay, and now let's take one more hand up um, uh, before the Q&A here. Um, let's see, Charles. By the way, great questions. You got a great group there. Yes, definitely. All right, Charles, I think we can hear you now. Go ahead and... Hi, good evening. Thank you very much. Um, so I... Uh, uh, partly, I wanted to ask if you've, uh, Mr. Keene, if you've attended any of the tours that are now offered at Hart Island by the Parks Department. Uh, I think you would probably enjoy a lot of the tours that they're offering. Uh, full disclaimer, I also work for the Parks Department. I am the supervisor who was assigned to the island. Um, so if you ever wanted to chat about any of the history of the island, I'd be happy to do so as well. You know, that's great. You know, I wrote the book. Uh, actually, well, it was published in 2018, six years ago. But along the way, and I was still living in New York. Uh, I don't know uh, if Steve mentioned, but I used to live down in New York City. In fact, I went to graduate school at uh, NYU. But for the most part, I lived most of my life in upstate New York until 2018, at which time we moved out west. But during that period, 2017, to 2018, I had attempted to look into the tours, which were then being quote unquote allowed by the corrections department. Um, and they made it uh, almost impossible uh, to be able to do that. They, they would allow you to sign up, but then they would cancel and so on and so forth. Uh, by the way, at what point, I know this probably happened just fairly recently that the parks department now controls Hart Island, correct? Yes, that's correct. And when, when did that happen? Jurisdiction changed over in uh, 2021. Okay, so fairly recently. So tell me, tell all of us, what, what are the tours like now? Because they were pretty limited when the corrections department, in fact, they didn't allow you to tour the island, as far as I could tell, they, they brought you to a central location and, and basically gave you a spiel about the history of Hart Island and so on. But what is what are the tours like now? Great questions. So the, the tours are a bit more extensive than uh, what you may have been used to during the Department of Corrections jurisdiction. The tours, there is a north tour route and a south tour route. Uh, so you would have to go to both if you wanted to tour the whole island. Um, but it does, uh, the tours do a very great job of helping contextualize Hart Island within New York City and a lot of what is going on at the time, which is very similar to your book, which I've read and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, right, but it, there's a lot of good uh, context setting and some of the historical information, some of the information that is known about the island, well-known, and some of the more little known history 
uh, of the island as well. I don't want to tease. I don't want to spoil too much of the tour for anybody who's interested right, in going. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the tours are uh, offered free to the public. Uh, they are by lottery. And uh, you can go on to the New York City Parks Department's website for Heart Island and uh, look up information on how to register with the Rangers Tours. Fantastic. Thank you, Charles. Okay, so moving right along, like I mentioned, there's a lot of questions here. Um, so, you know, not sure at this point if we'll get to all of them, but... Um, Okay, question from Conrad, I think, um, was just uh, very uh, uh, adequately answered um, by Charles. Can one visit and explore Hard Island? Um, and the answer is yes, especially now that the Parks Department uh, um, is overseeing things, which is a great thing. This is an interesting question from Meredith um, for you, Mike. My great-great-grandfather was buried in 1933 in a quote-unquote Catholic trench. Were other religions separated like this? Did a priest come over to bless the graves? That is pretty interesting. I'm not aware of that. I, my research does not tell me that any of that occurred, uh, that there was any religious involvement at all. And, and certainly, I didn't run into anything that would have indicated that they were um, religiously set apart from one another. Um, so no, I, I can't say that I have. I, I will tell you that um, uh, in the book, and also more particularly on the podcast, uh, there is an ep there's a, an episode of the podcast and a chapter in the book about the great tenement um, fire that, that came through New York City. I don't have this note in front of me, but I think it was in 1919, where a garment uh, factory uh, caught on fire and over a hundred women jumped to their deaths uh, as a result because they had locked the uh, doors leading out to the fire escape. And I uh, interviewed a professor at NYU. Um, I think her last name is D-I-N-E-R, Dinar, I think is how she pronounces it. Um, but there's a an organization in, I believe it's Staten Island, um, the Jewish organization that back in 1919, um, they had uncovered the fact that some of these women were Jewish and they were going to be buried at Hard Island. And this Jewish charity came to their rescue and took these women, I believe it was a total of 15 or 16. And when I say women, a lot of them were girls, 15, 16, 17 who were working as seamstresses for the uh, garment uh, company. And they were taken, in order to prevent them from being buried on Hard Island, they were taken back to a, a cemetery on Staten Island. And so that's the one, uh, to me, interesting piece of how a religious involvement came about uh, because of the Hard Island. Or that they prevented people from being buried on Hard Island. Okay, great. Let's see. This is a um, question from John. Hard Island started in 1842. When did bodies from other New York potters' fields begin moving there? What John said. Uh, also a very good question because they started disinterring people. In fact, in, in the book and on the podcast, I have a number of uh, unmarked grave locations in New York City. Uh, people are very surprised to learn that Washington Square Park, where NYU was located, used to be, it had thousands of unclaimed bodies. Um, this would have happened gradually over a period of many, many years. I never came across any information as to that specifically. Uh, of when they did that. But in the video, when we have it titled Too Many Bodies, by 1822, there were so many that they needed places to relocate some of the bod bodies. In fact, they were buried in such haste as a result of smallpox epidemics in particular, that they were only buried one to two feet deep. And there's an episode in the book 
that describes what that was like to be walking about on top of thousands of bodies that were not buried properly. Okay, let's see here. Moving right along. Um, again, fo folks who want to watch the Yankees uh, um, right now, feel free to uh, um, to to log off. Um, but you know, we'll maybe go for about ten more minutes of Q and A as long as you're all right with that, Mike. That's okay. Okay, so a question from by, Sheriff. By the way, if anybody hits a home run or something, you got to come back to us and let us know. Anyway. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I don't have it on here, so please, right. folks, feel free to weigh on. Uh, weigh in and let us know. Okay, this is a question from Cheryl. I've been trying to pinpoint the location on Hard Island where a distant relative was buried in 1932, but the microfilm with that particular record is missing. Mm. I was wondering if there are any other sources that might have the burial locations listed. Well, we, we just had Linda Hunt uh, call in with a question. Linda, as far as somebody on the ground and her uh, the work that she's done about people buried, buried on Hard Island and her virtual uh, cemeteries that she has on her website, I think would probably be your best source uh, to ask her that question. She might actually be able to help you. Uh, you know, you have to figure that there's only so many people that, and, and I hate to say this, but you, you've only scratched the surface and being able to get this information. But Linda Hunt, uh, the Heart Island Project would be an excellent source. Okay, great. Um, let me see. Okay. Uh, how difficult was accumulating information about Heart Island and the interred? Where did you find the information you used for the documentary? I uh, found it in other books, in other uh, websites, uh, in letters. Uh, private letters that were written. Um, sometimes you have to back up into these stories where you hear about, for instance, uh, Bobby Driscoll, um, that you, you've heard of the individual and now you need to know more about him. And you go to research uh, his career, his life. Um, in fact, in the podcast, I interviewed a fellow by the name of Dave Bossert, and Dave Bossert worked for Disney Studios Animation. He worked on many of the uh, famous uh, Disney animated movies. And although he never personally knew uh, Bobby Drisco, he knew a lot about him because he worked for Disney. And Bobby Drisco was, uh, was an icon as far as uh, Disney goes. And so, I learned a lot about them also from interviewing people who either knew them uh, or knew about them. Um, the story of Dawn Powell, the woman who was the author and who was ended up on Hard Island because her publicist wouldn't accept her body. I interviewed Tim Page. Uh, Tim Page is a professor at UCLA and he purchased all of Dawn Powell's uh, works. Uh, and, and when I heard about that, I reached out to him and called him. And we had a wonderful discussion about Don Powell. And also, I ended up interviewing him for the podcast. So a lot of the information came about that way. Frankly, relying upon other people who had done other work uh, or had written about or had done movies about some of the other people buried on Hard Island. Hey, great. So um, there's, it looks like two more hands up right now. Again, if you have your hand up, that means you're comfortable uh, asking the question live. So Francie, um, we'll go ahead and give you um, permission to speak. Let's see here. You'll have to unmute Francie. Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and um, move on to Julia then. I'm not sure if Francie's with us still. Okay. Yeah, hi. Hello. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. Very interesting. So my question is, would female inmates from Rikers Island have been burying bodies in Hart Island as well? Uh, no. As far as I know, the only Rikers Island inmates that were on the burial squad were all males. Um, also in the podcast, um, somewhat a little bit in the book, and I wish I had her name written down in front of me, but when you interview 40 people, some of them escape you. Uh, their names escape you. But she uh, is a professor at uh, City College of New York. Uh, she actually has been to Rikers Island, has interviewed many of the convicts there. Well, actually, let me back up. As some of you uh, perhaps know, uh, I guess we really can't call them convicts because they haven't been convicted of anything yet. Uh, as far as I know, the vast majority, if not all, Rikers Island inmates are people awaiting trial. Anyway, uh, she interviewed a number of, uh, of the inmates who were, who were on the burial squad and, and discussed with them and, and they spoke about why that was uh, something that they liked to do and how in the case of some of them, it made them re totally re-examine their life, their life as a people who had committed crimes, uh, re-examine their lives as somebody who uh, took drugs and, and so on. Uh, so in its own strange way, being a inmate who uh, was a part of the burial squad at Hard Island uh, was a way that some of them actually were able to redeem themselves. It's a wonderful story. Wow. Do you uh, happen to remember her name by any chance? Um... Uh, you know what? I have the book right here. Let me put on my, uh, let me see if she's on my pocket, but. If you want to go to the next um, question, Steve, I can maybe pull. Okay, so here we go. Boy, this podcast is great. I have to tell. Oh, um, okay, actually, I have another episode on Ellis Island. You have to, uh, you have to listen to that. Okay, uh, in, she wrote a book called Inside Rikers: Stories from the World's Largest Penal Colony. Her name is Jennifer Wynn, W-Y-N-N. -N. Uh, she teaches a writing class, at least she did then, on Rikers, and she's a professor of City University of New York. Thank you so much. How's that for the last minute? That, that's pretty good. I'm impressed. Okay. There we go. Thank yeah. you, Julia. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Wow, no, no shortage of questions. We'll take two more, um, and then and then we'll we'll call it a night. So again, apologies if we we didn't get to your question. There's just a a lot of um, a lot of questions for for tonight. Um, let's you see. know, I have a, I have a, if you go to my website, uh, I do have a email address uh, tab there, and you can use my email address by uh, you know you can just send me an email. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's see. Um, okay, let me see. Okay, some of these questions looks like have already been answered at this point. Um, oh, here's an interesting, interesting comment um, from Leslie. Mike, uh, thank you for your documentary to bring attention to Hard Island. But Heart Island is not all death and gloom. There were those of us who found it a place to rebuild their lives, such as myself, in the buildings there that were turned into the rehab community known as right. Phoenix House. Phoenix right. House. Um, that's an interesting point. I didn't realize that there was a Phoenix House um, on Heart Island. The, the drug rehab uh, center, uh, Boys Reformatory, as was, was mentioned during the um, the documentary. I wasn't aware that they had started any new uh, facility there. I don't know if she's referring to one that had been there years ago or 
or something new has been established, but. Oh, okay. Let Leslie. Um, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, we'll, we'll give you, um, permission to talk. It's an interesting, interesting bit of, um, of history to Howard Island, multiple uses as, as Mike already said in the talk. Okay. Let's see here, Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Hi. Um, yes, yes, the, there was more than one Phoenix house there. There were three, the wow. Castle, the Moors, and they they named them three, dif three different, I can't remember the other one. But that was back, I was there in 19, between 1972 and nine, or 1973 and 1976. Right. They, and um, uh, <clears throat> it was, it was really a, it was a wonder it was wonderful in many ways and it gave people an opportunity to build their lives and i was one of them and i on to become uh is although i had a, a, a lurid uh time in the street and with drug addiction and this that and the other um i uh i became a registered nurse and <laughs> retired happily now <laughs> with a pension and social security, but, um, Congratulations. It, it, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it was, it was a place to, that many people came to try to, you know, to build their lives again. And, um, that's how I think of, I remember Hart Island that way and the going, having days out and going on the, the, um, the fairy and the fairy the the fairy who a uh, guy who navigated the fairy his his personality and it, it was um it was a great place and i we never i never well i knew that that they that potter's field was there but it was it was on another part of the island so i mean mm -hmm. but it it could very well be that we were walking over. It's not anymore. It's not there anymore. They they uh, disbanded those buildings, yes. and um, and we don't. Uh, uh, but I'd really like to go myself and a few of my friends who were there as well uh, are looking into trying to set our feet back on Hard Island because um, uh, we had a. a a uh, a a a mem a good we had a lot of good memories of the time that we were there. You know, Steve, I I don't think we can end on a better note than that. Somebody That's right. who said they found Hart Island to be a wonderful place. That's right. That's right. As as much as uh, as much as it's a, a site of mass death and burial. Um, there's also uh, uh, life that uh, um, was found there. So thank you, Leslie. Really, really um, great contribution. And yes, many, many other questions, but unfortunately, um, we'll we'll have to end our time tonight. Um, it was great seeing so much interest in this topic. Um, and even though obviously we're not in person, um, um, let's go ahead and give uh, Mike a round of applause, uh, virtually anyway. Uh, um, can't really hear it. it. It doesn't really have the effect, but uh, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to um, spend this evening with us and um, hope everyone has a great rest of your evening. Um, please uh, stay on the lookout for additional Bronx Historical Society events. We have um, quite a few more coming up, including some virtual events, but also plenty of in-person programs. You can stay up to date on all of them at bronxhistoricalsociety.org. Um, that's bronxhistoricalsociety.org. Or if you want to take a simple route to the same place, bronxhistory.org. It'll get you to our website also. Um, and also, we appreciate any support from folks. If you want to donate um, to support the work we're doing and bringing free programming um, to the public, Really appreciate all of you here. You can find a donate button on our website as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, I'll circulate an email uh, to everyone who registered tomorrow with more information and how to get in touch with Mike. Um, so 
hope you all have a good night and uh, let's go Yankees. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mike. Okay.